The Radio Forest Podcast. This is Joe Bonamassa calling. How you doing? Doing great, man. Welcome. I just played some cream on the radio. Now, you played with all those members, didn't you? Yes, I have. Good point. Not all at once, but I've played with every member of the band Cream, starting with Eric Clapton in 2009. Then I played with Jack Bruce in London as well. Actually, they've all been in London. Jack Bruce at Royal Festival Hall, 2011. Finally, in 2019, I played with the late, great Ginger Baker. That was a unique experience. How cheery was he? <laughs> oh, it's, it's basically, if you saw the movie, Beware of Mr. Baker, it's everything you wanted to experience in an encounter. Rest in peace. He was a hard man to get to know and a hard man to love, but he was one of the most brilliant drummers that uh, the century's ever seen. He was really a special musician and a one-of-a-kind individual. So now where would you rank Jason Bonham then? Let's talk about famous drummers that you've worked with. Are you guys going to do another 2023 album, right, with Black Country Communion, I think? We're talking about talking. Glenn and I are going to start to write, and we're just going to see where it goes. So we're, we're taking it in like baby steps. As far as drummers are concerned, Jason Bond's like one of my favorites of all time. If you listen to Jason, he has, to me, equal parts his father and equal parts like Chester Thompson. He has a real unique prog sensibility, but also this lay it down, huge downbeats, huge pocket like his dad. And he's such a well-rounded musician overall, and he can sing, mm -hmm. which a lot, a lot of people don't realize that Jason can sing. His voice is very much like Paul Rogers, believe it or not, because he's known to being a drummer. But when he sings, and he sings a lot with Black Country Community, his voice is a lot like Paul Rogers. He's a, just a consummate musician and, again, one of my favorite people and drummers. You know, I was talking to somebody earlier this year. I can't remember off the top of my head who it was. But I'd heard a rumor that Steven Seagal had Albert King's Flying V. Can you confirm or deny or add to that rumor? I can confirm that he has all three of them. Whoa, really? Yeah. He loaned me one for a tour I did in 2015. He was nice enough to loan me one. He loaned me the Dan Erlewine, which was the, the one that Dan built him in the early 70s, which was the one that said Lucy on the headstock. He has that guitar. And he also has the Carina 59, the early V. And he has a 67 Cherry V that was a, a, a reportedly on, that was the born under a bad sign guitar. So I, I, can, I can confirm he owns all three of those flying V. Is it sacrilegious to then tune it to standard tuning? Because wasn't Albert, didn't he have like a really super odd tuning that he kept his guitars in? If you really go down the rabbit hole and tune your guitar to open G minor, you can pretty much see how he would play in those positions and get some of the voicings that he did. Uh, my friend Josh Smith and I, who Josh is a wonderful guitar player, plays in our band. We went down that rabbit hole and we were like, yeah, we watched the footage of Albert and we watched how he played. Now, mind you, he's playing high strings on top. We don't play high strings on top. We play low strings on top. But we're looking at the positions, flipping it around. Yeah, it's an open G minor. Like Albert Collins, he was open F minor. It's kind of the same intervals, but, you know, Albert Collins would put a capo and move the pitch of the guitar up or down by using a capo. Albert just played straight. He just learned all the positions throughout the neck and had a unique voicing and chord. So is it sacrilegious? I, I don't think so. Everybody has a process and, and a way of doing it. We're talking to Joe Bonamassa. He's on his 2022 fall tour coming to the Morrison Center here in Boise. November 28th. Joel, let me ask you a little bit about your early life. Oneida Lake, have you been there? Oh, yeah. Kind of from I, northeastern I, Pennsylvania, but I used to spend summers at that lake, and I know that's kind of in your neck of the neighborhood. I'm like, I bet he's been there, too. Sylvan Beach, that was the low-budget vacation spot for all those upstate New oh. York people. And when people think of the state of New York, they associate it with New York City. Big buildings, metropolis, urban. It's very rural. Once you get out of the Catskills, once you hit the Catskills and, and go west, you're pretty much in a very rural, it kind of looks almost like a lot like Pennsylvania and Wisconsin and Michigan and that type of topography. It's, it's not what people associate with New York. Oh, you're from New York. Okay, you must be 23rd Street and 8th Avenue. 
I wouldn't go down there, by the way, right now. <laughs> but you know what I mean? It, 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 it's, it's not, a, it's not, it's not that it's, it's very rural. So we had lakes and summers and a very small town life. That's how I grew up. Let me ask you about a couple of guitars. You mentioned the Karina Flying V, which I'm a huge fan of. Right. Also am obsessed with the Les Paul Juniors. I'm kicking myself. I saw one for sale a couple of years ago in a pawn shop. I played it, but I didn't plug it in. And uh, mm-hmm. you have a couple of both of those, I assume, right? I know you've got Les Paul Juniors, and I know you've got Flying Vs, and I'm pretty sure you've got yeah. your own signature Flying V. So talk me through, why am I so in love with that Karina and so in love with the Les Paul Junior? Well, okay, so... Full disclosure, I have about 500 guitars, so chances are, and most of them were made between the year 1950 and 1965, and most of them say Fender or Gibson. A Flying V is a very unique instrument. Now, you have to remember 1958, the Flying V and the Gibson Explorer were launched, and nobody bought them. That's why they're so valuable and they're so rare, because nobody bought them. It was a big ask for a family in the late 50s to have their kid want to play electric guitar in the first place, let alone play a flying V. So a lot of them were just dumped in music stores and ended up being sold cheap, destroyed, whatever. And now they're north of $500,000. That's one of the things that's unique about them. Sonically, they have a very unique sound. They're a rock guitar. They're a blues guitar. They're a very unique sounding instrument in the Gibson space. A Les Paul Jr., is pretty much, if you want the optimal Les Paul Jr. tone, you have to look no further than Mississippi Queen, the late, great Leslie West. I mean, for a student guitar, they're extremely powerful, and a lot of people love the fact that there's not many options on them. You can just basically plug them in. You have two knobs, a volume and a tone, a P90 single coil pickup, a mahogany slab body, and then a dream. If you can make all that work, that's why Les Paul Juniors are so cool. But now, does a Les Paul sound better after you break the neck? It's not true. <laughs> I, and I don't suggest anybody trying that. It's worth a lot less. What is right. more dangerous for you? Would you say it's the Chicago Music Exchange, Norman's Rare Guitars, Reverb, or Facebook Marketplace? Okay, I can take two right off the table. I don't do Reverb, even though I like those guys. I think it's a beautiful business model. I don't buy anything from Reverb. I'm not an online shopper. Facebook Marketplace, I've never been on it. Chicago Music Exchange, very dangerous. I know all those guys. Andrew, it's a great shop. It's a great experience. You have to go there when you're in Chicago. I will be there in a couple of weeks. Uncle Norm and I go back to when I was a kid. And Uncle Norm is the most dangerous because we go back for so long. We're family. And I bought a lot of guitars, including a 58 Karina Flying V from Norm. So I would say as far as dangerous and fun, I would go with Uncle Norm at the very, very top because there's always something there that ends up being put into my car. Even though I say to myself, when I go, I'm not buying anything today. I'm not buying anything today. And it turns out to be completely untrue. Yeah, but he knows you. See, he knows what you're looking for, what you might not have, what you want, what you don't know that you don't want. Correct. So all of those outliers, some in the middle, it becomes dangerous. Now, before we run out of time, talk about some of your recent success producing albums. I know you've got quite a few awards and some accolades. You've got some new stuff. You worked on quite a few albums in the past, yeah. I don't know, five, six years. Well, I mean, our first album that we produced, Josh Smith and I, was uh, uh, Reese Winans and Friends, which is our keyboard player in our band. So we had everyone from Vince Gill to Warren Haynes and Bonnie Bramlett, Keb Moe, the list goes on and on. And, and so many great people came in support of our buddy Reese. We started with that one, and we've done albums for Larry McRae. We've done albums for Joanne Shaw Taylor, Joanna Connor. We just did one for Jimmy Hall, the legend uh, from uh, Wet Willie. We've done a lot of records. We've worked on a lot of projects. Uh, we just did one for Mark Broussard, wonderful singer, one of the best ever. And, you know, I'm just glad that people are enjoying our records because we actually take the time and we care. And we want the best for the artists vis-a-vis going, well, we're just out of budget. I guess we can't finish this thing. You know, our company, Keeping the Blues Alive, is a 501c3. And it's not about a for-profit business. It's, it's about giving someone an opportunity to make a record that could possibly change their lives. Joe Bonamassa, three-time Grammy nominee. He's got the record for the most number one Billboard Blues albums. Now, I think it would be underselling you to say blues artists coming to Boise. I think... Uh, a rock and roll star, an entertainer, 
Yes, there'll be some blues licks and yes, some guitars on stage. Joe Bonamassa yeah. live here, Morrison Center, November 28th. Joe, thanks for the call. Good luck with the guitar hunts. And we hope to talk to you soon, Thank man. Thank you. I appreciate it, man. Thank you for doing this. Cheers, dude.